of the most common experiences of everyday living is wind. Whatever else we do, we have to reckon with the weather when we are out of doors. Sometimes the wind seems almost capricious. But when flying is your business, the wind can't be just something to cope with. Winds are your element, particularly when you are a navigator. That's why the Air Force and the U.S. Weather Bureau spend a great amount of time and money keeping track of winds. Since a navigator has a need to understand the wind more thoroughly than most people, suppose we have a closer look at this subject. The movement of the air around our Earth would be sluggish if it were not for the sun. Because of differential heating, one part of the Earth becomes warmer than another, and the air above the warmer areas expands and rises. Nearby cool, dense air under higher pressure then tends to flow into the warmer areas. We call this the pressure gradient force because it is due to the gradient or differences of pressure between the air masses. Over a large area, pressures may vary considerably. These differences create a pressure gradient force that drives the air into the less dense areas. Now, when you fly by pressure altimeter, you maintain a constant pressure level, since the altimeter is an aneroid barometer. Your true height, however, varies throughout the air mass. This variation in true altitude from air mass to air mass usually isn't more than 25 to 100 feet or so in 100 miles. If we selected a large number of points with the same pressure altimeter reading, they would describe a surface, a constant pressure surface, upon which all pressure readings would be identical. It extends in all directions, completely surrounds the globe. The surface we have represented is for the 500 millibar level, approximately 18,000 feet. Any number of constant pressure surfaces could be drawn. It's important to understand these wavy surfaces because much of your weather information is displayed in terms of a given pressure altitude. Meteorologists depict constant pressure surfaces with contours, much as a surveyor describes a hill with lines joining all points of equal height above sea level. These contours are normally drawn at intervals of 200 feet in true altitude. They indicate the physical shape of the constant pressure surface you've chosen to fly. A navigator pays close attention to these lines because they are his key to the pressure gradient force. Pressure gradient force always acts at right angles to the contours. Here is your first clue to wind flow. When contours are tightly packed, they represent an intense pressure gradient, a strong wind. And where they are wider spaced, we can expect the wind to be weaker. A system with high contour values in the center is known as a high. It has the characteristic tendency to move the air outward from the center toward lower pressure. When the center of a system is of lower contour value than the surrounding air, we have a low. The higher pressure outside establishes a pressure gradient pointing in toward the center, still directly across the contours. If we lived on a non-rotating Earth, we could stop right here and say that pressure gradient force creates a wind flowing directly from high to low. But because the Earth does spin, there's another twist in this wind business. A French mathematician named Coriolis demonstrated that when a freely moving body passes over a rotating globe to an observer on the globe, it follows a curved path. This is because our Earth has a west-to-east velocity of approximately 1,000 miles an hour at the equator. But as one moves toward the poles, the linear velocity becomes less and less. A projectile fired due north from the equator 
would have this initial west to east momentum of about a thousand miles an hour. As it traveled northward, its sidewise momentum would exceed that of the Earth's surface in the higher latitudes. It would outrun the Earth's rotation, and we would say the projectile's path was deflected to the right. This effect, named for the mathematician, is known as Coriolis force. In our discussion of winds, we will make frequent mention of Coriolis because any non-steered body moving in the northern hemisphere is deflected to the right, with a force greatest in the higher latitudes and diminishing to zero at the equator. In the southern hemisphere, Coriolis effect is to the left. Now that we know about this deflection, we can see why wind movement is not directly from high pressure to low. Coriolis force swerves the air, giving us in the northern hemisphere the familiar clockwise winds around a high and counterclockwise around a low. In the southern hemisphere, the wind flow is reversed. Let's examine this effect closely, taking a single particle of air as our perspective wind. To have a wind, we first need pressure gradient force, acting from high to low. Now, the moment the particle moves, Coriolis force deflects it to the right. The result? A new line of motion. Instantly, Coriolis switches with it, since Coriolis always acts at right angles to the direction of travel. Pressure gradient, still accelerating the particle, continues to shove it toward lower pressure. The faster the particle goes, the stronger Coriolis becomes, and the more the particle veers to the right. After the air has been turned a full 90 degrees, Coriolis still tries to swing the moving particle to the right. But now, Coriolis is working directly opposite pressure gradient force, and the air has no place to go but in this direction under the momentum it received during the battle of forces. If pressure gradient increases, the particle's higher speed induces an increase in Coriolis force. When the driving pressure falls off, Coriolis diminishes. We now have, for the first time, a wind blowing directly along the contours. We call it a geostrophic wind, a name signifying earth turning, hence the wind that results from the rotation of the earth. There's an old weather maxim that says, in the northern hemisphere, if the wind is at your back, the low is on your left. It's a handy thing to keep in mind. You'll be hearing a great deal about geostrophic winds because a lot of your navigation is based on them. At least that's the way Willie Bubble Chaser found it. Willie's been through this course, and if he knows anything, it's his geostrophic winds. Willie makes regular weather observations then carefully studies his flight plan to see how he's doing. You see, Willie started out with an optimum flight plan, a course that would let him take advantage of those clockwise winds around the highs and the counterclockwise winds around the lows. But Willie graduated from this course, and he knows in-flight analysis. When the weather doesn't quite follow the forecast, Willie makes adjustments in his optimum flight path. Yes, sir. Willie figures the winds ahead and flies accordingly. He even has a pretty good idea of how strong the winds ahead will be. There's a geostrophic wheel for this. So, the geostrophic winds are your key to the direction and intensity of winds aloft. But as a Finnish navigator, you'll need to know about certain conditions that may alter the geostrophic wind pattern. For instance, when anything travels in a curved path, centrifugal force sets in. In a weak system, where contours are widely spaced and curvature is gentle, you can disregard it. But in a strong system like this one, centrifugal force plays an important role. In a whirling pressure system, centrifugal force tries to throw the air outward from the center. Consider a single air particle again, still under geostrophic conditions pressure gradient and Coriolis force in balance. As the particle starts around the curve, centrifugal force tends to drive it across the contour. Momentarily, there is a new line of travel, and Coriolis swings to keep at right angles to it. Now, 
pressure gradient and Coriolis are both in a direction to retard the wind. As the air slows down, Coriolis and centrifugal force are reduced to the point where the two forces achieve a balance with pressure gradient. The resultant airflow is along the contours, but at the expense of wind speed. We call this a gradient wind. The gradient wind around a low is weaker than a geostrophic wind with the same contour separation because of centrifugal force. While intense highs are less common, you should be familiar with gradient winds in these pressure systems too. In this case, the pressure gradient and centrifugal force act together, so the resultant wind is stronger around a high. The rule of thumb then is that for a set pressure gradient, winds are weaker around lows than around highs. As you advance in skill, you will learn to recognize when this difference becomes important in your calculations. Another factor that sometimes upsets the geostrophic pattern is friction, caused by obstructions on the Earth's surface. The friction level extends only a few hundred feet above smooth terrain and bodies of water. So, in flying at, say, 700 millibars, you're well above the friction level where the terrain is smooth. But over high mountains, where friction may disturb the winds as much as a mile above the peaks, you can expect to experience surface wind conditions. Friction reduces the wind speed, and Coriolis becomes less. But pressure gradient is unaffected, so there is a new wind vector. The wind now blows across the contours. Over mountains, friction may shift the wind as much as 70 degrees, and wind speeds may drop 30% or more. The important thing to remember is that friction causes the wind to flow across the contours in the direction of the pressure gradient. In highs, the flow is across the contours out of the system. In lows, across the contours into the system. And there you have the basic facts about wind, what causes it and how it acts. The various driving forces in the atmosphere set up winds that behave according to well-established laws, going clockwise in high-pressure systems and counterclockwise around lows in this hemisphere. Your clue to the speed of the winds is the spacing of the contours. Where the lines are close together, count on intense winds. In a tightly curved low, however, expect centrifugal force to slow the winds down. Around a high, it makes the wind stronger. Remember that as you penetrate the friction level, which sometimes is found at considerable heights above rough terrain, you will find the wind slower and its direction across the contours toward low pressure areas. But most of the time, you'll be flying under essentially geostrophic conditions at least north of 15 or 20 degrees latitude. In the next film of this series, we will see these wind facts take on meaning in the preparation of navigation charts for long overwater flights.